Hi everyone, my name is Fiona. I'm an audiologist based in Sydney, Australia at the Children's Hospital, which is located in Westmead. I'd just like to say a big thank you to Intraacoustics for inviting me to take part in this webinar. I think it's just such a wonderful idea and I've always learned a lot more from case studies and I hope you find this one helpful. So just to provide you with a quick summary of what we're going to go through, I thought it would be helpful to just cover how, a little bit about how the newborn hearing screening program works here in New South Wales. We'll then move on to a bit of the history of the case study. We'll go through the results and then have a little bit of an overview of what we would do next. So each of the Australian states and territories operate their own newborn screening program. I'm based in New South Wales and Sydney is the capital. The SWISH program, as it's called, operates using a double AABR model on all babies, no AOE screening. The AABR model is conducted on all babies except for those deemed at risk. So, for example, those with atresia or bacterial meningitis, et cetera. Those babies are referred directly through to audiology. The stimulus for the equipment is set to a 35 dB pass. So the program is not aimed at picking up the very mild losses. There are three diagnostic sites in New South Wales two of which are in Sydney and one just outside. And I included this little map to give you an idea of the distance some of our families need to travel. So although England apparently fits into New South Wales approximately six times, the population of England is seven times larger than New South Wales alone. So we don't get that many referrals through, but they do need to travel quite a long way to get to us. Our ABR protocol mimics that of the UK protocol very closely. Um, we do use DPOAEs as standard as opposed to TEOAEs. The equipment that we will be looking at is, of course, the Interacoustics Eclipse, and our tympanometry is also on the Titan. So, my little patient. They were a bilateral referral from the SWISH program. They were seven weeks old at the time of the initial appointment, but three appointments were offered and not attended prior to this one. The family has been given refugee status um, and an interpreter was used to book all appointments. However, it is very unclear whether limited education was a contributing factor to their non-attendance. The baby was delivered in Australia, but the pregnancy was complicated by very poor prenatal care. There was a very traumatic delivery with a nine-day NICU stay that was required, and there are still medical investigations ongoing. And there was very limited family history able to be obtained on the hearing history in the family. So on to our results. I started with tympanometry using the high frequency probe tone due to age and OAEs. And you can see from the graph in front of you that the OAEs were, uh, sorry, that the tympanometry was beautifully peaked, a lovely aerated middle ear system, and, but the OAEs were absent. It's always quite tricky to know whether to start or finish with your tympanometry and OAEs. You should always do that for your patients where possible because it can help provide you with a guide for what to expect or where to start for your ABR. The golden rule, however, if your baby is asleep, never wake the sleeping baby. So moving on, Apologies, where do we start? So we use ASSR to support our ABR findings. We don't use ASSR in isolation for our SWISH referral babies, um, but we do tend to use it to try and as a bit of a cross-check tool for our ABR results. It's very quick. It's You can do both ears at the same time. 
And because of the case history, the referral reason and the results obtained so far, so our peaked temps with absent OEEs, I started at 50. And as you can see, with your green that's coming through here, I was able to drop quite quickly down to screening levels. And these are the results obtained for the right and left ears for air conduction. Moving on to the ABR. Now, if you think about the patient's case history and the information we have attained so far, this will help guide our starting intensity. We need to aim for one high frequency and one low frequency piece of information as a minimum. And as you know, this is going to help guide if we need a hearing aid fitting, but it's also really important to try and help out, help rule out any reverse sloping hearing loss. You always need to test both ears. And by using the split screen, you can also see the waveforms in both ears at the same time. And this will help you when you're reviewing the morphology of the waveform to determine if there's any major difference between the ears. So because I obtained a satisfactory ASSR, I could have started at 10 dB above the pass level. However, if you're uncertain about your waveform morphology or you want a guide to help with marking the waveform, you can consider starting at a moderate level. So for example, the one above that's at 55 dB. So having a look at that and eyeballing that, that looks like a beautiful clear wave. By taking away some of the subjectivity to the ABR, we, there's other uh, systems in place on the Eclipse that will help make it a little bit more objective. So for example, if we look at these different quality checks, for example, the rejects level, our residual noise, or our FMP. Now, our testing room is unfortunately not optimally shielded. So our rejects level tends to sit at plus or minus 10. So the higher this level, the more sweeps you need and also the higher the probability you will need weighted ads in order to reduce the noise between the waves when you overlay them. If we have a look at our residual noise, the average, this is our average background noise. Ours is set to 25 nanovolts. So we stopped these particular waves that we looked at on our previous screen here when we got down to 25 nanovolts. If we now look at our FMP curve, where our target is seven, and for each of these, we got 26 and 22. So we very much achieved our target. So although through our subjective eyeballing, we clearly thought our waveform met the criteria for a clear response, we can take some of that subjectivity away and create a more objective approach. And by using all these different inbuilt quality checks, we can now safely say, this is a clear response. So now that we've determined that we've obtained a clear response in both ears at 55, we now need to find our threshold. We aim for 20 dB EHL at all frequencies, apart from 500 hertz, which is at 30 dB EHL as the gold standard for our department. So bearing this in mind, for this patient, I dropped to 25 dB NHL, corrected to 30, and obtained the following results. Now, this grey line, when enabled in the setup, and when the normative latency data exists, this can help guide you as to where you place your wave five marker. So if we have a little look further at what we've recorded, we are having a look again at our FMP and at our residual noise. All of these are achieving beautiful results for our 15. So we've now gone down to threshold. This is our completed result. As you can see, each of the waveforms have a lovely morphology. 
the latency shifts from super threshold to threshold. There is a good correlation between each wave. Now, our residual noise is optimal, sitting beautifully at 22 to 23, 24 nanovolts. And we've got beautiful FMP values. So we can clearly say that we've achieved a clear response at threshold for four kilohertz. So what do we do next? As we mentioned earlier, we need a high frequency and we're aiming to get a lower frequency. 500 hertz is really useful, particularly when you get or you don't get your peak temp. So it's good to know if there's a conductive overlay. But 500 hertz is more susceptible to our mains interference. And as I've said to you before, because our room isn't optimally shielded, we find 500 hertz really quite challenging. So I opt to go for one kilohertz first before I move on to 500 hertz because I want to try and get as much information from my baby as quickly as possible before they wake up. So when we have a look at testing one kilohertz, the same principles apply to ascertaining the presence or absence of a response as we apply to our four kilohertz threshold. You can also start with a louder intensity. So on the screen in front of you, these are the responses I obtained at 25 dB NHL. But if you're not sure of your response or you're not sure where your markers might go or you're just, you don't feel that the response you obtained was clear, you can always start with a louder intensity to help with your marking. So here's an example for the right ear. And again, here's our normative latency data to help with marking our wave five. So summarizing our results for this little one, we obtained peak temps bilaterally and absent emissions. But we then got a satisfactory ABR at one and four kilohertz with an ASSR that correlates to the ABR. So what does this mean? So before we got the ABR and we got the ASSR with my absent emissions and peak temps and bilateral referral from the screening program, I was expecting a significant hearing loss, but was quite pleasantly surprised that all of the data that I recorded proved me wrong, which was great, but it's still quite puzzling as to why we would have our absent emissions. So at the moment, we've scheduled them for an eight-month behavioural follow-up and then in the meantime, keeping a check on this baby to try and see what any of the medical investigations might reveal. Thank you for listening.